Hello, Rodeo fans. Welcome back to the Short Round Podcast. It's a big, the official podcast of Pro Rodeo Canada, I should say. But I'm um, your host, Wacey Anderson. Once, you joined, uh, once again, joined by Clay Creasy. Clay, it's uh, a milestone episode for us, episode 25. We, we've made it this far, which is pretty cool. And I guess we should also celebrate the fact that we hit 10,000 downloads over the past couple of weeks. So, I mean, we're we're small steps, but we're, we're making stuff happen. Absolutely. It's, it's been a journey. It's been quite an experience and, and getting to be back involved and engaged in rodeo and and hearing positive feedback. CFR was great to get to chat with a few people that, uh, that really appreciate what, what, uh, what we're doing. So that's always nice to hear that (laughs) because sometimes you just don't know what people are thinking, but uh, they're, they're liking it and, and that's great to hear. So no, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's nice to hear that people are actually listening because sometimes it feels like maybe we're just talking to the to the abyss. So yeah, it's always yeah. nice when we get feedback and 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 obviously all the the time that guests have set aside for us to to do the interviews and and the great stories they tell and what they're willing to share is it's it's neat to kind of give people a behind the scenes look at what happens with the contestants and in pro rodeo and obviously keep people up up to date with what's happening in the in the industry. So it's been it's been a fun journey. I'm excited for the next twenty five and beyond. Well, and and I can't remember if I had mentioned this story from CFR or not when I was in the CPRA booth, the the lady that came up and and she was like, I swear your voice is, is familiar and everything. And it's like, oh, well, Clay does the podcast, somebody mentioned. She's like, oh, that's where I've heard it. My husband made us <laughs> listen to it all the way to Arizona. So, oh, perfect. Yeah. So we're we're downloaded. Some people turn on the uh the YouTube here and all the all the look at our ugly mugs media <laughs> outlets they like. That's good. Yeah, it's sweet. And I guess, yeah, I guess if anybody listening to this, keep giving us the feedback. We appreciate hearing that people are listening. And if you have any guest suggestions or topics we should talk about, we're, we're happy to hear you out and, and bring it forward on the show. It's, it's, it's been fun, man. Like I said, I'm glad that you were able to come on and, and uh, help me out with this. It's always nice to have someone to to shoot the shit with. And and yeah, I think we're we're building something pretty cool here. So hopefully we can keep plucking along here. No doubt. Cool. Okay, well, I guess... It's kind of a bit of a lull time of year here right now where we've just wrapped up CFR over a month ago. We're waiting around for the Maple Leaf Circuit Finals to start. All the NFR qualifiers are out. All the year-end awards are done. We're kind of in, in a kind of just a waiting period for stuff to start happening again here. But um, in the meantime, the Canadian Parodial Hall of Fame had their induction banquet on March or November 2nd, I think it was, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, but we just want to shout, send a huge shout out to some of the, the inductees for this year. So we have contestant Oscar Walter, contestant Travis Whiteside, contestant George Spence, uh, builder Scott Byrne. Um, for the animal this year, we got the tie down horse from Logan Bird, TJ, legendary horse. We talked a lot, a lot on this show. And then our 2024 legend is Doug Larry Etherbridge. Um, and going into that category. So pretty, pretty prestigious class of people heading into the Hall of Fame this year, Clay. Absolutely. And and kudos to that whole group that that organizes everything for the Canadian Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. Uh, before the, the Cal Nash Center was built, I know they were struggling to really find a location where they could really mm-hmm. build some roots. But since that place has been established and since that organization has really come together, they've they've really been able to to really make it a, a place to stop and visit and and see the history of of pro rodeo in Canada, which is great to see and and great for for our sport to have. And and it looked like they had a tremendous event. I thought mm-hmm. it was just so cool. Your your guest this week, Cody Lamb, up there singing with Mel Highland and Mel Brown, and it looked like Billy Melville put a heck of a job on uh, Ghost Riders in the Sky. And then <laughs> to see Robin Burwash uh, running that steel guitar, that's that's just something. I mean, that's, that's yeah. not an everyday piece of, uh, <laughs> no, you can't just pick that up but, randomly. You got to, yeah. Be oh yeah. Oh, hey, look, I'm good at this. Like, yeah, <laughs> no. So no, but it looked like a tremendous event and, and just a great way to honor all of those legends and, and contestants and, and people that have been so meaningful for the sport. Yeah. I just want to echo what you said there. It's cool. It's, it's kind of a, another tip of the cap to the, to the crew behind all of that. I know, it's probably not an easy task keeping track of everything. And like you said, finding that, finding that home in Pinocchio, when you think of rodeo in Canada, Pinocchio is one of the first places to come to mind. So I couldn't think of a better home for them. And, and like you say, congratulations, everybody. It looks like an awesome event. Definitely one um, to set aside on your calendar. If, like, like we said, if you're in this lull time of year, but looking for something fun to do that, that banquet looks like a, a heck of a fun time. So um, yeah, definitely keep it on your radar. Um, 
But yeah, Clay, like I said, it's kind of a slow time of year, so I don't know if we really have much else to discuss on the top half of the show here unless you got anything before I throw it to uh, Cody Lamb. You know, just a co- couple of different events that were taking place. Obviously, we've got some of our pro rodeo bull riders that'll be in Edmonton mm-hmm. again in Rogers mm-hmm. Place this weekend with the PBR Canada Finals and a lot of the bulls that we see at our pro rodeos. Uh, that bronc riding match they had down in Australia sure looked like quite. Oh, the, yeah. Good call out. Yeah, that looked really so cool. Seeing seeing all of the, the top bronc riders because we see so many of those bronc riders when they're younger kind of come up here. I mean, you've seen Glenn O'Neill, Dave Appleton mm-hmm. right now, Damian Brennan, those those Aussies come up here. And and I mean, they've they've left their mark up here and 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 Cowboys have gone down there over the years as well. I mean, this is kind of their summertime, right? Mm-hmm, so it mm-hmm. works for a lot of people, but to have that kind of in this little bit of time and, and helped with the CFR being earlier for, for contestants like Logan Hay and Colby Wanchuk and those guys to go down there. So just, it's, it just speaks to the fact that uh, the sport of rodeo is growing that bronc riding is, is just kind of gaining a, a foothold in, in everything. And an interesting note that I'd saw in that bronc riding nation is they are kind of importing bloodlines and genetics from North America into okay. their, their buck and stock. So mm-hmm. I'm sure that's been more of a thing at the PBR level down there over the years, but to see that they're, they're moving some, some bloodlines down there. I saw pictures of some tiger warrior cults. So best of luck cool. down there guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you brought this up, Clay, because I had a question I was thinking about that I wanted to ask you. That maybe like is is Australia kind of going through a similar thing as Canada where we're kind of seeing the bronc riding, the the next gen of like great bronc riders coming through there. You know how we have like our great crop of guys and it seems to continue to grow and grow. I feel like that's happening in Australia. You got like Jake Finlay and Damian Brennan who are doing really well in, in North America. But I feel like there's especially with events like this is going to help it explode even more in Australia. Absolutely, and you know it's it's been kind of neat because I uh, I've kind of followed that they ha- they call them extreme bronx events in australia yeah and i've i've just seen those pop up when they kind of happen down there and yeah you see some of those guys i mean they're they're celebrities in their own market right mm-hmm. and and uh the the knight family they're uh they're a bronc riding family that over the years have had many individuals come up here and rodeo in canada and and then most of the time return back to australia and and uh, Brad Pierce was a guy that my brother college rodeoed with out of Snyder that I still see is is tearing up that circuit down there as a bronc rider and mm-hmm. and so it's tough I mean it's it's not a gimme for for people to go down there and and yeah you see people like Damian Brennan and Jake Finley I mean they're always gritty yeah <laughs> you, <laughs> you live on Vegemite and, and everything like that and and they're always tough and and get through a lot of everything and they know how to ride and, mm-hmm, and handle mm-hmm. those horses. And so it's, it's cool to showcase it and, and really put the the market in kind of the, the front of everybody's mind. And hopefully we'll see more kind of crossover mm-hmm. events like that. Yeah, it's cool. It's it's pretty cool. And I, and like you say, I think saddle mark riding is further establishing it, its hold as the most popular event in rodeo right now, as much as probably some people hate to admit it, but it, it is. It's it's pretty awesome. And we're, we're so fortunate with the, the amount the the great talent we have going down the road and the on the on the four legged and two legged side of, of, of the coin. So that's yeah, pretty cool. And then was was the other event you were gonna talk speak to the Hondo Rodeo Fest that's going on this weekend? Or what what did we did I miss one? Um I mentioned the PBR Canada finals. PBR there. Canada and the Bronc ride. Anyways, so I, I guess I have an event I want to talk about. So this weekend, the, the Hondo Rodeo Fest has happened down in, in Arizona there. Kind of Cord McCoy and his family, um, they're having an event in where the Diamondbacks play. So it's kind of a kind of following the lead of uh, of the uh, San Diego Rodeo and kind of moving to like this music festival rodeo combination type thing. So I saw some highlights from the first night. It looked like a pretty cool event. So um, one to keep an eye on it to see if it can grow and continue to stick there. I know Arizona's got a good rodeo crowd, so won't be surprising if it does stick around for a long time. Absolutely, I, I and I I give all the credit in the world to the C five company and and the production company they're working with in San Diego. I know they're fighting battles that mm. you're likely not to run into in a market like Arizona or or any of those places. But to see rodeo making a big enough footprint to to earn a spot in those type of venues that's it's awesome i mean the year this that the nfr happened in uh, ranger stadium was just cool i thought it was such a cool event so <laughs> yeah. it it kind of 
maybe sparked that idea for a lot of uh, production companies and, and event venues mm-hmm. and things like that to think, well, let's, let's do that here. I mean, these stadiums, baseball stadiums, I mean, a lot of the time they're that off season, what else do you they're do sitting there? So, yeah, exactly. And then, and you can open the door for like being able to bring in bigger acts. And we saw the American brought post Malone. And I think the, there's a pretty decent lineup for like that. Hank Williams Jr. is playing that Hondo deal last night. So, I mean, you, you, by having these, these unique venues with more seats, you can bring in more people, which again, exposes more to folks, studio, which helps it grow at the end of the day. But yeah, like you say, pretty cool to see these, new unique twists on what rodeo is going to look like moving forward no doubt we've we've seen houston we've seen san antonio like those large venues there mm-hmm. i mean houston that that building i mean football stadium is as big as it is but yeah you, yeah you start stepping into the baseball and yeah, it's there's a lot of real estate in there. yeah yeah it's pretty cool but um anyways clay i think that's that like like i said we were a little little light on action this week but we, we make up for it with a great interview here with the 2024 canadian champion bareback rider cody lamb and i guess we'll throw it to that now and we'll catch you all right after this all righty welcome back to the short run everyone this week we are stoked to bring you the 2024 Canadian champion bareback rider Cody Lamb to the show man Cody how you doing man has it has it sunk in that you are the 2024 Canadian champion yet yeah um starting to sink in a little bit uh sometimes I still catch myself kind of like a dream come true type of thing you know I chased that for a long time and uh yeah as a lot of you know my career has had its ups and downs up to this point so to to check that one off the off the list is is a big one well, and let's let's get right into the to that week and then even just the season itself. Like you say, it's been a lot of ups and downs. And it was even coming into the CFR, you had to kind of scratch and claw your way into there. So what was what was the feeling like going into the last the latter half of the season, like knowing what you had to do? Like what was what was your mindset as you as you moved into those final weeks? Yeah, for sure. I mean, coming out of the CFR last year, um, only been able to get on four or six there in Red Deer, and it took me a really long time to come back from that. Um in January there, I went to San Diego and Fort Worth and uh, some of them and tried to tried to get riding again. And it was just too much too soon. I ended up having mm-hmm. to take off till June. So I didn't really have a lot of expectations for this season. Um, just getting back into the arena and being able to ride again was big. I, like I say, I didn't know what my career was going to look like, what capacity I was going to be able to keep riding just with the nature of the injury I had. And yeah, it was a rough season, even getting back into it. It took me a long time to, to really get rolling. Um, I I didn't draw the best I ever have in my career <laughs> this year, which kind of aided to the struggles a little bit. I mean, I think it uh, the Medicine Hat Summer Rodeo, I think I had less than four thousand dollars won, and mm-hmm. I was about nineteenth in the Canadian standings or something to that effect. So yeah, it was it was a struggle. I I knew if I had if I could hit some good luck, I could make the CFR. But like I say, I didn't have a lot of expectations for the year, and then coming into the CFR was the same. I just, um, you know, I came in season light leader last year and I had all the pressure, all the expectations. I had mm-hmm. an absolutely unbelievable regular season and it all kind of fell apart. So I, I've been able to learn from that experience and that, you know, getting to ride at the CFR isn't a, isn't a sure thing. So I just tried to go in and make one ride at a time and let the results take care of themselves. How, how taxing was that mentally knowing, like even back to last year, but you said you had an unbelievable regular season and obviously injury made the CFR tough for you, but that had to have taken its toll mentally, even just to get back to the point of competing at a high level. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Neff, you know, like we say, I've been through my fair share of injuries. This one really kind of made me recognize the, you know, short nature of a rodeo career, maybe more than any of the other ones had. Cause it, like I said, I didn't know, if I was going to be able to come back and, you know, in what capacity I would be. So I was, you know, obviously a lot more grateful to just be at the CFR in that this year. I mean, um, like I say, the expectations and the pressure weren't there for me this year, you know, coming in season leader. So yeah, I just, it was really nice getting to come in in a lower spot and just go and try to make five great bareback rides. That was really all I had to focus on. There was not a whole lot else on my mind. You know, 2023 was, in a dream in a lot of senses and a nightmare in a lot of senses, because I mean, the worst thing I could imagine happening at the CFR basically happened, but you know, I lived through that and I learned from it and, you know, going into it this year, I didn't really feel like I had a lot to lose because I'd been through mm-hmm. one of my worst 
nightmares of a situation anyways. Well, how, how important was the people you surround yourself with in that process? And I know you travel, you and Orrin Larson are really good buddies. You, you kind of grew up in the same area as Clinton Lay. You rode you down south. You've been, been around the best in the world for a long time. But how pivotal were those guys in helping you develop that kind of championship mindset? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Oren's great. Um, him and I have traveled together since 2015. Um, nothing bounces off a guy like it bounces off Oren. That guy can. It's a big mustache. It. Just bounces right off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he's been. That guy's crazy. Like, um, he doesn't really fight his head that much. He doesn't really get into slumps that much. Like I've seen that guy get bucked off one day and be 90 points the next day. I mean, mm-hmm. he just has an uncanny or an uncanny ability to just reset his mind and keep going. And I think, you know, maybe he struggled with that a little bit at the CFR this year, everybody, like we kind of seen Warren mm-hmm. a little beat up, a little banged up, but you know, for the most part, traveling with a guy like that, he's always supportive. He always, um, he always believes that you can turn it around in a day too, right? Like he, uh, so that's big. Um, you mentioned Clint there. Um, I've I high school rodeoed with Clint. I've been around Clint most of my life. We rode steers together way back in the day. Um, but yeah, having having Clint there riding at the top of his game, I got to talk to him a little bit about this after it was all over that night. I mean, I was really grateful to have him in a situation like that because riding against a guy like Clint in that situation really brought out the best in me. Um, mm-hmm. You're only as good as your competition, right? So if you're not riding against the best guys, you're not your best. So yeah having to having to show up in that last round there and and compete and have to be my best to win the Canadian championship is about all I can ask for. Yeah, but it was cool to watch you guys duke it out. I mean, Clint's had so much success and like over the past even 5 6 years in his career and just to kind of see you guys duke it out to the bitter end. You you mentioned it in the story. Was it with Diane Finsett who you talked to for the CRN or was it um tim ellis i can't remember who he, or maybe it was he was dave even anyways there's a story on you in the latest edition of the canadian rodeo news and you kind of mentioned it was that diane up. i believe yeah yeah so being able to, to duke it out with with clint it's, it's such a cool thing and kind of like a two of the more storied bareback riders of this generation kind of going at it for the 50 cfr was kind of a cool storyline to follow the whole week yeah um again i i can't put it any better than the the guys you get to ride against really bring out the best in you. So my whole career, Clint's been, he's pushed me to be the best version of myself and yeah, to have it come down at the 50th CFR in my hometown and get to have that experience. It's uh yeah, it's pretty cool. So, so before we get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of the week for you, but yeah, let's touch more on the, on the 50th anniversary of the CFR being so close to home for you. And obviously you grew up going to Rexall and, and then you were through with Red Deer and then, and now you get to come back and, and win the title in your hometown. Like talk about that experience, just how amazing it was to be in Edmonton for the 50th CFR. Yeah. Um, it wasn't anything I ever really thought would happen again when, uh, when the CPRA originally signed the contract to have the CFR in Red Deer, I believe that was a 10 year contract, which at the point was, I think I was 26. So, you know, 26 to 36, that's most of the rest of my career. Like, I don't know how long I'll go for, but yeah, I mean, personally for me, I guess the fact that COVID happened and the CFR was able to move back to Edmonton as a result of that, I guess is a little bit of a silver lining for the whole pandemic situation, but yeah. Um, again, I never really expected the CFR to make it back to Edmonton. So the mm-hmm. fact that it was, and, you know, coming off the injury that I did and I was able to be there and then come out the champ at the end of it was yeah, pretty surreal. Yeah. It's, it, it was a, such a cool week. And it's one of those things, like I've talked about this a few times with people of, there were so many nights of like, there was the right matchup at the right time. And it, it all came down to the person who had to get it done. And that doesn't usually happen all the time, but it seemed every night that everybody stepped up to the plate did their job, which made for like an exciting week of rodeo, as we saw with all the records broken and big rides and fast times. It was pretty cool to be part of. Yeah, for sure. I think the the stage was set in Edmonton for great things to happen. Um, Red Deer did a great job when it was there, but Edmonton felt really special. I mean, the atmosphere was there. The energy of the building itself was there. I think everybody showed up knowing that it was going to be a special event being the 50th back in Edmonton and that uh, the stakes were going to be high and everybody was going to be competing at the top of their games. How, how cool was it to be at that level? I know, I think Denny told me this, that you, you got to meet Corey Perry in the week and you told him that you were in, in the, the the fan park during game seven when the Oilers lost, but to, just to be at that level competing in on an NHL ice surface, I guess we could say, but just how, as an Oilers fan or hockey fan, how cool was that part? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been a huge Oilers fan my whole life growing up in Edmonton and that cup run was pretty surreal. The, uh, 
the O three comeback. I mean, they didn't get it done, but that's still one of the wilder playoff experiences. I think the NHL has ever seen. Um, but yeah, I got to meet a bunch of the Oilers, uh, a bunch of them were down there during the orientation night. We got to chat with Skinner a little bit and I seen Derek Ryan and a few of the guys down there, but yeah. Um, it's so cool to get to, to be that close to, it makes what we're doing feel more like the professional sport that it is having that close contact with some of those guys. I mean, I know Connor and Leon were in the house the last night there, which is, which is huge for the sport of rodeo and it's huge for the CFR to kind of get that attention and get that support from those guys. So yeah, that's um, kind of a unique experience at Edmonton, I think. And I'm glad that this sport got to have that. I think, I think we talked about it when we did our the live show there um, during the CFR, but it, it, it seemed like this move to Edmonton was like the natural next step at the end of the day. Like, like, we, like, like, like Reggie did an outstanding job, but I feel like it was getting to the point where it was outgrowing the venue and outgrowing the space and, and to see it go to Edmonton and, and experience the success that it did in the first year and then see the, the kind of um, warm reception from the city was, it was a nice kind of refreshing thing. Whereas it maybe didn't <clears throat> receive the same amount of, I don't know, like, like, backing from the city of Red Deer, I guess you could say, but it was cool to see that kind of the next step and, and the room to grow that we have in Edmonton. I think room to grow is the best way to describe it. I mean, <clears throat> Edmonton's a big city. We got a big building there that hosts events a lot bigger than we are. And I think we have, yeah, like you say, the opportunity to grow into that. And we had a great 50th, but I foresee in the next five, 10 years getting even bigger. And um, rodeo was growing really fast all over North America, like with the, uh, the cowboy channel and some big rodeos that we haven't seen before and it's it's getting a lot bigger and i think in canada we have to step up to that as well and i think uh having the cfr in edmonton at rogers place allows us to do that for sure it's it's, it's pretty awesome and like you say i think it's just it's the sky's the limit for it when you mix in everything that's going on and then the level of competition as it continues to grow it's, it's going to be great to to follow along with but let's get into your week man it, it was super fun to watch you um obviously all the things you accomplished but let's let's go kind of round by round and, and kind of break down how your your pathway to that first Canadian title. So round one, you're 81 and a half points on Little Rotten of C5 Rodeo. So you finished third round, picked up a, like 5,000 bucks. Like what was there, what was your feeling after that ride kind of heading into the next day? Did you, did, did you like, did you kind of go in knowing you had a chance or was it just like you said, one horse at a time, whatever happens, happens type of deal? Yeah, I spent a lot of my career trying to over engineer everything and trying to have everything planned out beforehand. And honestly, it hasn't really worked. So um, I just knew that, you know, I wanted to not get too excited or too down about any draw. I think a lot of guys take themselves out of the competition before the first guy even nods their head because they didn't get the horse that they wanted. So I, and I've been one of those guys, like, you know, damn, like I didn't draw, I didn't draw Virgil in the first round. Like that would have been sweet, but, or, you know, any horse in there. But so, yeah, I, my, one of my main focuses for the week was just to take it one horse at a time, get on the first one. Little Rotten's a great horse has been a good horse for quite a few years now. Um, I'd never had the opportunity to get on that horse before I drew it once a couple of years ago, but I was right after I got injured. So I didn't get to go. So yeah, I was excited for that matchup. And, uh, Again, I, I have a lot of faith in myself and my ability to ride any horse. And I know most of the time, if I show up and do my job, I'm going to win some money. So yeah, that's what I tried to focus on. So we go to the Thursday night round, you, you draw horse of the year, agent blinks and you put up an 89 and three quarter point ride. In my opinion, that's the best ride I've seen in that horse with my own eyes. And if I was judging, you would have won the round in my, in my humble opinion, but I'm, there's a reason why I'm not a judge, I guess. But what, what was it like to, to put a, such a good ride on that, on that horse? Like that, that's got a really kind of, give you some momentum heading into the rest of the weekend. Yeah, honestly, I think I was, I wasn't settled in to the CFR till after I rode agent links. I was mm -hmm. probably about as, I don't want to say nervous, but I mean, like keyed up, like, you know, hearts beating fast, you know, emotional, maybe a little bit more than I would have liked to be before agent links. And then after that ride, I was able to kind of settle in and be like, okay, let's go to work because yeah, that's an unbelievable horse, horse of Canada this year. Um, Tons of great rides on that horse, but that horse also isn't a day off. I mean, I've no, seen leaves I've seen, so hard. And I've seen very, very good bareback riders struggle with her. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in time and you're ahead of her, it, it's the sweetest looking thing in the world. But if she, if she gets ahead of you at all, you're getting bucked off. So, and that's what, that's what you want out of a horse. Right. So I knew again, I had a good opportunity. Ethan made a great ride on disco party. Disco party had a great trip. I'm happy for him. Um, but yeah, again, I 
like I say, I was just trying to take it one ride at a time. So I wasn't trying to get too upset that I didn't win the round that night, but I knew, yeah, as we know, the way the West, rest of the week turned out, it, uh, <laughs> yeah. it might've been the right call on my, my behalf. Well, and it gets to get, but it gets you into the mix too. You win another 8,000 bucks and that's your, your, your kind of clipping along back-to-back checks. And then, and then you pluck Virgil in, in the Friday night round. And we talked about it kind of extensively that day we had you on the show, the live show, but just for those who weren't there, those who haven't listened to that episode yet, but like, what was, what was that feeling? You see Virgil behind your name. I know you've been manifesting that matchup for such a long time, but to get him that night at the CFR kind of on your way to the Canadian title, what was that feeling? What was going through your head? Yeah. Um, there's so many, there's so many layers of this way. See that, uh, so many years of my life, kind of many things that have happened kind of all culminated in that one night. And, uh, it was, it was like being in, in a movie. It really was. I don't really believe in that most of the time, but some of the things that happened, like I, like I told Katie and, uh, I think Diane as well, after that, after that ride, I've had a picture of Jake on Virgil hung up at the house here for, seven or eight years since since he wrote him in 2016 i think it was at the cfr um i've i've drawn all the way around that horse for years orin and i we've entered every perf we knew that virgil was going to be at and uh orin had had him twice at the cfr but other than that neither of us had ever been on him we've kind of been chasing him around for a really long time and virgil's getting older too so i didn't know if i was ever going to get the opportunity to get on him um i think the closest i ever got in red bluff one year i went with mike solberg and Mike drew him. Um, so I missed him by one. That was as close as I'd ever been to getting them. Um, yeah. And then to finally do it, I mean, it was like, like I'd been saying all week there, I'd thought about it so long that there was, it was almost nice. And the fact that I, I knew I didn't have to think about it anymore. It was just basically show up, put your rigging on them and let it, and let it happen because I hadn't ever expected to get to get on him you know it was mm-hmm. one of those things he's a special horse he's a hard horse to draw like you got to be in a four man you got to be a finals like he's it's, it's a hard to get your name beside that horse but yeah it uh it i'm glad i never got the chance to get on him before that because getting to do it there and win the round and you know put that big score up was pretty special yeah, you couldn't have scripted any better, and and so and also they they changed the delivery on him because they bought him out of the left on on uh, Wednesday night. Then you guys had him out of a right on the Friday with this. Does that change the game for him at all, or was it? Did you know it was going to be okay, or, or what was kind of your thought process there? Yeah, Tyson gave me the choice actually after the draw oh. came out. He said, "Do you want him out of a left or a right?" And I and I I told Tyson because they had bucked him a right a few times this year. I think Buffalo Lake they had him a right mm-hmm. and a couple other places, but. I said, Tyson, honestly, he's your guys' horse, whatever you want to do with him. Like, I I honestly didn't want the decision. I was like, what? Like, it doesn't matter to me. I'll ride him either way. Like, whichever mm-hmm. way you send him, I'm going to ride him. So they had wanted to try him out of a right. I think they wanted to try him out of a right in the first round too, but the, the deliveries were already set, so they didn't get the chance. But I was like, yeah, if you want to put him on a right, let's go. We'll try it, and we'll see what happens. And, yeah, worked out. Obviously. Obviously worked out for the better. Um, okay, I want to try something here uh i've been doing this with a few other folks um but let's uh i'm gonna pull up your ride on virgil here okay you can see Got you it. on virgil okay yeah. so i want so what i want to do i've done this a few times on this with logan did this macy and her record setting run but I, I want i want you to kind of give us the breakdown um of what's kind of going on what you're feeling and just the, the ride overall it's in slow motion so we got some time but you 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 rock and yeah roll if you want to start before you even started i mean yeah yep Virgil's kind of funny if he stands there with his head down like that horse has so much personality that I've never seen a horse quite like Virgil he's got such an attitude and he's like there's that's a smart horse and he knows what's going on but most of the time you notice when guys have trouble with him he has that harder trip he stands there with his head down in the shoot a lot more and when a guy tries to go like they really got to get his head up and that's what he kind of did with me so I kind of sitting in there before I even nodded I was like huh like <laughs> better bear my ass down today because he's probably going to be a handful and then i've never really seen him stall like this so that was mm-hmm. kind of a an old pro move on his behalf too because normally he leaves pretty hard but yeah he, the gate opened and he stood there and i was like oh you <laughs> out of the gun so okay so you get past that yeah he's stalling right here and then he kind of goes down the gate here which i didn't expect my mark out was actually maybe a hair late i don't know i've seen that a few times but yeah and then he has a big right here that I don't remember. Like I kind of remember a little bit, but he kind of got me in the flats there. And then once I kind of got back in time with him, that was a big move, but 
Yeah, well, you, and we we talked we talked about this at, on the live show. Tyler was really hit. It's like you like if you hit him pretty good those first few jumps, like he sets up like he does here, and I feel like you're able to accomplish that. Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of advice for like Virgil's horse of history, right? I mean, mm -hmm. everybody has an opinion, and I talked to the two guys I talked to the most were probably Jake Vold and RC Landingham. I mean, RC got on him twice this year and put up mm -hmm. two absolutely monster scores. And the funny thing was. I got two completely different opinions. Um, <laughs> kind of the old enduring wisdom with Virgil was you got to hold him for two and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and let him set up before you go. And RC was like, man, screw that. He's like, go at him. He's like, do what you do. He's like, and I think that's the advice. I didn't really have a game plan. I kind of gathered all the advice and just kind of let it sit in my mind. But, you know, I'd been making great rides all week going at horses and it seemed silly to try to go and hold on to one at this point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I told this to Mike Solberg when he had him back in the day. I was like, you either, you either spur him or you get bucked off by the best horse in history. Like it's a no lose. You either, yeah. you either win first, or you get piled up. And like, I don't think there's any shame in getting bucked off Virgil. So if I was going to go, I was going to go at him a hundred percent. And yeah, that, I guess that was my game plan. So, so you're going to him here and he makes this big right here. So is, was there a point of this ride where you're like, I got you, you old bastard. Or what, what was the feeling like going through these next few jumps here? Yeah. Right through here. I kind of was, didn't have my time picked up that well and I didn't know what was going on. And then I think once we get through, I think about this jump here. Yeah. After that, I kind of knew it wasn't going to get any worse than it had already been. Yeah. I mean, he's strong coming across there, but he gets like, look how high in the air that horse. Oh, gets. it's crazy, man. You have so much time to set your feet for how big he is. And as long as you're beating him to the ground, yeah, he's strong. If he'd have beat me to the ground, like he's really trying to get me out over my rig in here. I remember mm -hmm. that, like, really having to push on it and stay back but other than that i mean just a big cadillac that guy definitely so strong cool, man. all there but yeah it was it happened in the snap of a fingers and it also took like three hours it felt like like that was a don't never had another ride everybody i've talked to that had been on virgil said there's no horse in the world that feels like virgil and that's 100 percent true i mean i've never had that experience it's cool, man. It was fun to watch. And, and like you say, he does get pretty, we even saw it when, um, when Zeke wrote him at his Bronc match in the Sharko towards the end there, he was really making Zeke like get his feet to the front and, and, and finish off that ride. Super strong, but it was, it was cool to watch, man. And, and like you say, couldn't have scripted a better scenario for you to do it. So you, so you, so anyways, so you, you, you get, you, the whistle goes, you grab down your rig and you, you get set down by the pickup man. Like what emotions are going through your head at that point? Like, do you, do you know you're going to break the Canadian finals record or do you like, what's going, like, what's, what are you thinking? Yeah, no, I had no idea what the score was going to be. Honestly, I've got off a lot of horses and thought I was going to be 90 points and I'm an 86 and I've got off a lot and thought I was going to be, uh, thought I was going to be 82 and I was 88. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to say because sometimes the way a horse feels doesn't correlate to how they're, I remember in like one Grand Prairie one year on Mucho de Nero and I got off and I asked for a re-ride because he bucked in one spot yeah. and then turned back and I thought he was just belly kicking because it was so easy. I was like, man, he didn't buck. And then I went, I think it was Terry Cook. I went and asked for a re-ride. I was like, Terry, what's a re-ride? And he's like, he's like, I had you a 45. And then I think I was 88 and a half. He's like, do you still want your re-ride? <laughs> I was nice. like, no, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks. So, anyways, um, oh. but yeah, so it it can be hard to tell on a horse like Virgil. I mean, I obviously I could tell he was bucking, but it happened so fast, and like mm -hmm. he gets a lot of guys after the whistle. I think guys quit riding him, so I I that was kind of in my game plan too. Like I knew I I needed to I couldn't just hear the whistle and then you know pack it in because you'll get ripped down and hurt worse. And he, of course, he still got two horses to ride after that, so I knew mm -hmm. I couldn't just. I had to, I had to take care of business. And once my feet hit the ground, I mean, I'm sure you've got the video of that too, but it was a pretty emotional couple seconds there for me. Cause you know, I knew I had made a great ride. I didn't, I wasn't really thinking about scores and then Brad announced the score and it was kind of a, yeah, a cascade of emotions that feel like they've been building up for a long time that all got to come out at, at once there. So yeah, it's probably the biggest thing I heard all week was about how emotional I was in the arena. Cause usually I play it pretty close to the vest, but I think if, you know, kind of finally learned how to use some of those emotions rather than just keeping them all inside and, you know, letting them out after, especially after a ride like that, I think it's probably a little healthier than keeping it to myself. Oh, it's for, for, from my, through my lens, like literally it's way cooler when you guys show some emotion and get fired up. It, it's awesome. And, and you could definitely see, like you said, like in that clip, after you jump off Virgil, you're, you can see the emotion, how stoked you are. And, and 
even the vibe in the building that night there was a buzz like it was like pretty much like a, as full as it's been um the whole week it was it was a really engaged crowd and so many things that happened and then just to set start the night off with you going 92 and, and a quarter like that's putting yourself in the history books on on the the 50 cfr it's got it's got to be a, such a great feeling yeah that was such a cool day i mean everybody in the everybody in the arena story that i talked to like everybody kind of knew what was i don't want to say what was coming but every most of the everybody knew I had Virgil drawn and it, there was, there was a vibe. There was an aura going on there. Dude, like yeah, everybody feel it. was, was excited to see it. And I've never really been a part of anything like that. Yeah. And like I say, the fact that I thought about that for so long and I visualized it so many times and like been through it so many times in my head really helped me because I don't know how I would have dealt with that otherwise. Cause it was like showing up to a, a heavyweight title fight. Like it was, yeah everybody knew something was going to happen either it was going to be a great ride or i was going to get folded up or like some, <laughs> something was going to happen i mean i the only the only other um experience i really had that was anything like that i got on killer b i'm the last bareback rider to ever get on killer b and uh, oh wow phillipsburg kansas i got on her and honestly it was like showing up to my own funeral like it was scary like <laughs> i got out of the car and every and everybody was like like really you came and i was like yeah i mean it's you know kind of I'm same here. deal you either get piled up by one of the best horses in history or your rider and it was just like that was kind of a similar experience i had with virgil it was like everybody that was there knew something was going to happen and they i mean I, I noticed in the back of that video everybody's looking like it was and that's pretty oh, cool man. to have that experience and you know to get to do something like that at that rodeo it's uh probably a once in a lifetime opportunity all right so like you like you said like i said before you couldn't you couldn't have scripted the way that went down any better and like and also like the aura like was legit like when we had you at the live show you could just tell like you like you were obviously ready for the matchup like everybody was ready to see it happen but you you knew that you, it wasn't one of those things you're like you're going into it, i hope i ride him or whatever you've been preparing for this you knew you're gonna something was gonna happen and, and it happened and we're very thankful the way it went down the way it did so moving on i guess you see so you pick up another eleven thousand bucks from that from that ride was the thought of a canadian title creeping into your head after that I think Are so. Are you letting it, I guess, too? I think um, even before I got on Virgil, it's like that's the kind of opportunity it's going to like make or break your CFR, right? Like mm -hmm. if it goes well, you know you've got a chance to win Canada. And if it doesn't go well, like, you know, you still got two horses to ride. But I think if Virgil got the better of me, I wouldn't have been thinking about a Canadian title as much. But, you know, it um, again, after Virgil, it's like my whole life is different. Like the, the landscape <laughs> of my entire life changed in one night. So now, how so yeah. how so we go, go in that a little deeper yeah i mean it, it kind of goes back to the fact that everybody's watched me struggle for quite a long time and i think everybody always knew i had a lot of potential but up to that point i hadn't really capitalized on a lot of it like i've had some wins and i made some cfrs but kind of when the lights got turned on i always seemed to find a way to not make it happen so that was kind of a big even just with me internally to show up and have that happen. Like I gained a whole nother gear within myself that it's like, okay, now I'm a guy that can do that. What can't I do? So that was pretty special. But at, on the other side of that, I really had to rein it all back in because, mm -hmm. you know, we had to ride at 11 o'clock the next morning. Good I didn't get you. a lot. I didn't get a lot of time to celebrate. I mean, I went to the buckle ceremony. I had a couple beers and I think I was back in my hotel room shortly after 11 and, you know, try to get yourself to go to sleep because hey, you got to be up fairly early for a, for a rodeo performance the next day and get some food in you and get ready to do it all again twice ended up three times for me but <laughs> yeah I mean maybe it would have been I don't want to say it would have been nicer because I think the best celebration for me is getting to just go and get on again because I, I didn't have a lot of time to to dwell on it and be like oh wow like look what I just did and feel mm -hmm. super special about myself because yeah I mean ultimately I know I've said a lot to the contrary, but my goal was to win Canada. My goal has been to win Canada for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so having the stage set to be able to do it was special. And I knew after Virgil that I had a good chance, but like we say, Clint came out riding like a monster on Saturday. Like, Oh yeah. If, if I'd have taken my foot off the gas at all, Clint would have been the Canadian it's champion. Over. I mean, and that's, and that's special for me. Like to have, Clint, like I said earlier, to have Clint there riding that well, um and to have to be my best like 
I don't know if maybe I would have enjoyed it or as much, or if it would have been as special if I could have just phoned it in after Friday night, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm, just, mm-hmm. you know, stay on my last two, whatever, not a big deal. Like it was really special for me to have to, you know, set that aside and come back swinging the next day because yeah, you know, there was no guarantees there. Well, and you really, and you really had to, cause so going into Saturday, the afternoon, Clint won the round with 88 and three quarters. You pick up another check, which helps the cause with 85 and three quarters going into the final round. Um, you rode true grip, but I can't remember the horse you, you got the rewrite on uh, the first horse. Sleeping, you got on. sleeping giant. Yeah. So going into, going into Saturday night, drawing sleeping giant, um, Clint has sideshow. What was kind of the the vibe going into that? Like, did you, did you, were you like not super stoked on the horse you had, or just was it an off day for the horse? What was, what was that deal before we get to your rewrite? Yeah, I don't know. Um, that was a great horse all year. They won a lot of money on that horse. Won mm-hmm. quite a few rodeos on sleeping giant. Um, the TV pen is hard to set. I mean, I'm the bareback riding director, obviously. So <laughs> I, it's task to me to set the pens for the horses and the, and the group, but ultimately I'm the guy that gets the final decision. So, I mean, I'm the guy that put that horse in there. So I can't, I can't knock the horse because it was my decision to put him there. Um, and I mean, like I say, I hadn't been on him. I don't think I'd ever even seen him in person, but I'd seen lots of videos and guys said he was great and he felt good and he fit that pen really well. So yeah, I don't know what happened there. Sometimes horses just don't have their day. And yeah, I mean, I get more re-rides than the average guy, I think anyways. One, I'm a bigger guy too. I really get a hold of horses and sometimes that makes them, you know, a little bit more front endy like we've seen with Sleeping Giant there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, that that might have played into it. Um again, whether that was the horse I wanted or not, I, doesn't really matter because it was the horse I drew and Mm -hmm. you know in situations like that you can kind of think about it from the other side and it's like if you tell yourself you're going to win Canada then obviously that's the horse you needed to draw to win it because you're going to do it so like that that's the right horse for you whichever Mm -hmm. way it turns out so I mean yeah I just tried to go in and again it was I was trying not to think too much about winning Canada like again it was five five rounds five great rides was was my only objective there to make the best ride I could make five times in a row. So yeah. um, Ended up being what it was, but that was that my, my game plan stayed really foundational all week. So, so it works. It works. So Clint, he, he puts up an 89 and three quarter. He's leading the round before your re-ride. You had to wait a while and your your re-ride ends up being true grit. And that was the horse that Ethan had originally drawn, but he was hurt. So he had to turn out. So you end up with true grit. Um, Obviously, that's a, a big time horse. Clint was ninety and a few on her on him at Strathmore this year. Yeah. Like, like one of the best best horses we got going right now. But you got to wait around almost an hour before you get on this sucker to 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 kind of decide your fate. What was what was that kind of waiting period like before you actually got to to seal the deal? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, granted, it was my third horse of the day too, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. True as enough. you get older, getting on three in one day gets more difficult. I mean, but. <laughs> And especially with all the emotions, right? Like that drains you. Like it's a big oh. event. Like part of you even going into round fives, it's just like, shut your mind down. Like get this over with. Like mm-hmm. it's don't overthink it. Just go out there, do your job. It's just another bareback ride. And then yeah, I've true grit was another horse. I'd never had the opportunity to get on unbelievable generational horse in Canada. Like that horse, mm-hmm. I think one horse of the CFR in 2012, like that has been an like, unbelievable horse for a That's, lot of years in a row. Yeah. So um originally the re-ride was astron acres which is a great horse as well i've been 87 on astron before um but with the turnouts obviously true grit gets moved up so i i'm walking back to the shoots and tanner gerlitz walks out to me and i said it's astron right and he goes yeah and i'm like okay fine whatever yeah. i said do you, do you want to do it right now or in the bronc riding and he said probably in the bronc riding which had i known the bronc riding was so far away <laughs> Like it would have been tight to turn around and go again, like three or four minutes later. And I was pretty winded, like I say, yeah, third yeah. horse of the day, but I didn't think it was going to be as long as it was. And then when I got into the center alley, Tanner came back and he said, it's actually true grit. And I was like, oh, even better. Like Zastron's a good horse, but like true grit's a, like I say, an unbelievable lifetime horse. Um, So yeah. And then I went back to the dressing room quickly, like grabbed some rosin um, stuff like that, came back out. And I can't remember who I talked to. It was either Kyle Danes or Jillian probably. But I said, how much time do we have before the bronc riding? And they're like, oh, not much. And so I thought it was going to be, you know, just one or two events. Well, I think there was three events and an intermission. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> standing on the back of the shoots there for that long, like every negative thought I ever had about myself came back <laughs> to me. Like, 
kind of like <laughs> every voice in my head that ever existed that was like you know you're not good enough for this you don't deserve this like you you know I've had lots of experiences in my life where I drew a great horse didn't work out I got a re-ride and it went even worse like I've I've stood on the on the banks of that many times to win mm -hmm. big rodeos and just like not had it work out and I was like here we are again like right back here again how huh? like I'm it's and then you know, that was a big growing moment for me as well, because, you know, often I've let that voice in my head kind of run away with me, but in that kind of call it moment that it was like 35 minutes that I got to stand there and fight with myself. Um, yeah, it was just kind of realized that that voice had never got me anywhere and it, it wasn't helping me. And that like, I didn't have to listen to it mm -hmm. and that it, my, my job hadn't changed. Like I still just had to go out and make one good ride. Like that was, that was all I had to do. I didn't have the math worked out. I knew I didn't have to win the round, but I knew I had to place pretty well. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't have it. That, like I knew with Clint leading the round, I was like, okay, you got to do it. Like there's no, there's no holding your feet for two. Like as soon as this gate opens, you start going and you know, whatever happens, be happy with it because yeah, I guess that was, I just wanted to avoid that. Like I wanted to know that after that rewrite, I'd gone out there and the CFR in general, I wanted to know, I went out there and I gave it everything I had every round. And especially on that last horse, win, lose or draw, I had to decide, you know, either you win Canada day or you don't, but all you can do is go out there and give your best effort. So that's what I tried to do. And it worked out. And, and, and you put up a matching 89 and three quarter point ride to, to Clint, which is kind of a cool way to, to start, like wrap it up. Like you say, being able to duke it, duke it out with him for the week and then, and then split the final round. That's, that's got to be a kind of a special way to, to cap off your, your first Canadian title. Yeah. I mean, it was cool in the grand entry there. They had Clint and I come out and do the stare down and then we ended up tying in the final round. And it took a very long time to get a ruling from the powers that be on who actually won it. Like I thought I did, but it was just like one of those things I didn't want to celebrate before they said, because nobody wants to be that guy, but yeah, they made me stand down there for a very long time. And <laughs> I think they announced on TV that Clint had won it. And then uh, like, I don't know, it was, that was, uh, took a long time for the levy to break there. And that part of might've been why it took me a long time to settle with it because I wasn't sure there for the first 15 mm -hmm. or 20 minutes, if I'd actually won it. So um, but yeah, it was, uh, Tanner Gurlitz said, like, he's seen me get a lot of rerides. He said, there's no better way for you to win Canada than on a reride is what he said to me before. I rode. So <laughs> That's cool. I, I tried to take his word for it. That was kind of my, uh, kind of been my style. I've had to get on quite a lot of horses to get the job done, but, um, yeah, no, I'm happy with it. And it is pretty fitting to have to do it that way. How, how freeing was it to get that ride done and, and, and put up a big score. And like, I think you said battling those demons, like leading up to it, that half an hour, like it, it had to be like the hugest monkey off your back, like getting that opportunity to deliver in that scenario. When, when you say you have, you kind of came up short a few times throughout your career. Yeah. I mean, you can see it in the video there too. I mean, I was pretty emotional. Yeah, I want to really. pull this. I want to pull this up. I, I found the clip and I want to, I want to pull it up. Cause this yeah. is like, this is probably like one of my favorite clips from the CFR is, is you, this, this is right when they're announcing the score to you and you can see you're waiting for it. You're waiting for it. But just like, you can see the relief and like just the weight off your shoulders. It's, it, it's, it's so cool, man. That's like one of my favorite shots of the whole, the whole deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, I don't know if I was necessarily even celebrating winning Canada there because obviously I didn't know, but like I knew I needed to make a great ride and I did like, I put up a great score and that was my job. And yeah, obviously after any finals, like it's their high pressure, emotional situations, no matter how guys um, convey themselves during that, like there is a big emotional blow off after that. And that started right there for me. It was like, yeah, for sure. A big sigh of relief because, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I try to put less than I used to, but at the end of the day, I, in that moment, I had achieved my goal of making five, evidently six good rides, which is what I wanted to do. So yeah, to get another score that good. I mean, before the CFR, I'd never been 90. I mean, mm -hmm. after I got off agent links, I was a quarter point shy of 90. And I was kind of like, damn, like, was that close? And then obviously <laughs> the next night on Virgil kind of blew all that away. But I mean, again, agent links, true grit and Virgil are the three highest scores of my entire career. So, I mean, pretty crazy week, even to just, even to just have, even if I hadn't won Canada in that moment, I think my reaction probably would have been exactly the same because it was just getting that done. And, you know, it's always nice to follow the plan and achieve a goal you set for yourself intrinsically. 
And it's like all part of that journey of like learning how to win and become a champion. It, it just like that mindset of the one horse at a time and, and going out there and making five or six great rides in a row. That's what you need to do to be a champion. And then at the end of the day, you've played the hand you're dealt the best you can. And then the chips fall where they do. And it ultimately led to a title for you. But that's, that's going to be such a, like a refreshing feeling too. Like just, okay. The process you've stuck to all these years, the the work you put in, the, the adversity you face has all led up to that moment. And it's had to be such a cool feeling at the end of the day, like that first beer after you got your saddle and gave your, got all your pictures and stuff done. It must've tasted pretty good at when you got to reflect on it. Yeah. I mean, like I say, throughout my career, I've, had lots of surgeries, lots, lots of injuries, lots of sit out time. And, you know, it gets to the point where you're wondering if you're doing the right thing, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, you can do anything with your life, but you know, did you choose the wrong thing? Because for so long, I seem to be getting so much evidence to the contrary that it was like, you know, am I crazy to saddle up and go one more time here? Like I knew I wasn't finished like on the inside, but you know, you kind of start letting, and not that the people around me haven't been completely supportive. Like I give all the credit in the world, to my parents and my family, like they've never given up on me despite, despite everything. They were never like, Hey, you know, maybe you should think about doing something else. They always stuck behind me and, and, you know, really left the decision to me. Like, if you want to hang it up, we're good with it. If you don't, we're good with it. Like just whatever you do, that's kind of, you know, my family, that was the big thing growing up, right? Like it doesn't matter what you want to do, but do it a hundred percent. And you know, that, that, and I was excited for them as much as that, probably even more than I was for myself, because the people, like I say, that, that didn't give up on me in those situations deserve that just as much, if not more than I did, because there were, I spent a lot of years not believing in myself. I spent a lot of years not thinking I would ever do anything like that, like wanting to, hoping to, but like, there's a big difference between setting a goal and actually believing you can achieve it. So I think lots of people set goals without ever really thinking that they can do it. So yeah, trying to get through a lot of them demons and a lot of that uh, just, you know, adversity within within the bounds of my own brain. Like it was, mm -hmm. that was pretty big for me to overcome a lot of that. And I'm really excited to see what comes next because I feel like I learned a lot. I, I learned more about myself in that week probably than any other week in my life. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what with what I've learned, what I can do now. It um, Parts of it almost felt like the end. I, I, I mean, I won't, I won't lie to you. I kind of thought like, shoot, does it get any better than this? Like, should mm -hmm. I just retire after this? Because this is a storybook week. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I don't think I have to worry about improving, like trying to have a week better than that. I think I can just keep making one great ride at a time and see where it takes mm -hmm. me. Because I mean, ultimately I don't think that was the end. I feel like that was just the beginning. I've said most of my career, I feel like I'm still getting warmed up and make, mm -hmm. maybe now I feel like I'm warmed up and I can start going. <laughs> Well, I, like you, you could see it throughout the week, man. Like that's like I've been watching you now for for a long time, and 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 just seeing like the way you rode and 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 like stepping up in those big moments, like that's got to be like then it, it, I don't. I, I would be sad if you hung it up after that week, just because there's so I feel like there's so much more. Right, the sky's the limit for you now. I like, just think seeing you can accomplish those goals and 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 make those big rides, like that's what that's what you need to do to kind of get to that next level. But I mean, you've you've achieved achieved the top of it. But yeah, I, I think it's going to be exciting to see what what comes next for you. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I don't know if a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of people have this experience, but I mean, I decided kind of what I wanted to do with my life when I was pretty young, and I've kind of stuck to that which is great, but I'm also still kind of living out the aspirations of a 16 year old. And it's like 16 year old me wasn't the smartest version of me. And it's just like, <laughs> is it silly to bet my entire singular existence on something that a 16 year old version of myself wanted? And, you know, I've kind of thought about that lately, like, you know, still haven't made the NFR, but like I have good feelings that that's still something that I can accomplish if things mm -hmm. go my way. But yeah, it was like, you know, you set those goals for yourself and then you spend your whole life working on them. And it's like, do you ever stop and look at them again and be like, okay, well, like 16 or 17 year old me decided that they wanted this, but it like, is that still true now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think going through those injuries, I've actually had the opportunity to look at that and be like, is, is this still something that I want? Because obviously if the answer was no, I wouldn't have been able to come back from all the things I've come back from. But again, what kind of what I said earlier with it being potential, like I knew I always had really good potential and I could do things like this, but you know, you get to a certain point where you have to judge yourself by the fruits of your labor. I mean, if you're not getting the job done consistently, like you got to have a look at yourself because you can't just be potential forever. You have no. to, at some point you have to either do it or don't do it. Like mm -hmm. you either got to, 
And, and that was a big thing. Like I kind of said with the Virgil ride, it was like, we're here, we're at the CFR. It's Friday night. You got Virgil drawn. Like, why would you hold him for two? Like, what do you say to yeah. yourself for? Like you either go out there and you do it or, and you know, I've had trouble with that throughout my career, like safety and up kind of, you know, riding to stay on rather as opposed to riding to win. Mm -hmm. And you said it earlier, like learning how to win is a big thing. And I didn't know how to do it for a long time. Like I found a thousand and one ways not to win. <laughs> like I have the best horses in the best situations and just find ways to, you know, not make it happen. Mm -hmm. Be 78 when I needed to be 79. Like, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was big. Like I say, I feel like this is the beginning. I'm excited to see what comes next. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I've enjoyed taking some time off here and, you know, recalibrating some of my goals and, you know, that's a big one to cross off. It's, um, like I say, I'm satisfied. Isn't the right word, but it does certainly take a little bit of the pressure off. Like now I can focus on, it seems like getting better and next year being an even better, better bareback rider than I was this year mm -hmm. without the kind of the, the weight of having a, an unachieved goal still weighing on me. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, like, like to to bring a hockey analogy into it. It's like Connor McDavid in the Stanley Cup chase. Like he he's he's recognized as one of the greatest ever, but will he be go down as one of the greatest ever until he wins the Stanley Cup? Which is like maybe not a fair comparison when it comes to rodeo, but I mean it's a similar story. Like you you you've had the potential, you've been great for so long, but there's been almost a little bit of a black cloud that you had. Oh, when's Cody going to win his Canadian title, or when's when is he going to get it? And you finally are able to lift that off, and it kind of opens up a whole new world for you when it comes to your career. Yeah, to bring a hockey analogy, and I think Sidney Crosby is a great example of that because I mean that guy won Stanley Cups when he was young. He won the Olympics, yeah. and he's still playing extremely high level hockey. Like he's uh -huh. still one of the best players in the league and he's done everything. And I think how that relates back to me is like, I love bareback riding. Like I love, I love working at it. I love getting better. And when you're dr always driving towards a goal, sometimes it's easy to forget that. And it's, and it's hard to wake up every day and think about that. But like, not that I've achieved everything I absolutely ever wanted to, nor do I think I need to, but I think this gives me a little bit more freedom to, focus on the fundamentals of what I do and why I love what I do as opposed to just chasing an external goal. Because yeah, when I talked about retiring there, I think that was probably the biggest thing that made me be like, no, that's a dumb idea because like, I still, I still love doing this and I, I I've never been at it for an external goal in and of itself. Like obviously doing those things is great, but again, coming back from all the injuries, I couldn't have done it if I didn't love to do it. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to come back and you know, go run sprints out in the yard or hit the gym or, you know, watch old NFR videos over and over and over again, trying to figure things out. So, I mean, I still love that process and I want to do it as long as I can. Obviously my career is over halfway done now and that day is inching closer and closer, but in the years I have remaining, I think that's the thing that excites me and invigorates me the most is the fact that I can still focus on just getting a little bit better in different ways every year. Oh man, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Like, like you say, it's, if you just if you keep building and putting those blocks together, like things will fall into place. And, and like your, your love for the sport, it's like, it, it's not unnoticed. Like, I mean, you say you're on the CPRA board as a bareback riding director, you're, you're giving back as much as you can. And, and, and even like through my, again, through my lens, you're always down to help me do what I do. And it, it, at the end of the day, it helps, uh, helps grow the sport and makes it better for everybody else too. Um, okay. One last thing before I let you go here, Cody, I want, I want to talk about, um, the money at the CFR. Obviously, you had a great CFR. You, you placed every round, I guess, and and walked away with over fifty five thousand dollars in, in CFR earnings. So, talk a bit about how that money changes the game. I, I know, like that's a big conversation on rodeo and how much more is available out there. And we see in the what we see in the PRCA, we're seeing it now in the CPRA. But a big week like that, how does that change things for you on a rodeo level and also on a personal level? Yeah, I mean, go back to the struggles we went through after Orn and I rode in Medicine Hat. This summer, like I mentioned earlier, I stood at the diesel pump and I couldn't afford to put diesel in orange truck. Like it was, I had a rough year. It was, I struggled. Um, I was down South in the States kind of rodeoing on my last day. Didn't have enough money to like, it's either win today or you got to find a way to get home. Like those are the options. And I managed to win that day too. But like, it was, I've never won that much in my career in one week. So it's, I've tried to just, you know, take it pretty easy. Like I didn't run out and make any huge purchases or anything, <laughs> but um, 
And on the other side of that, you know, 50,000 isn't as much as it used to be. I mean, no. it's not, it's not uh, like I can't run out and buy a house with that or a brand new truck or anything really to that effect. So I think maybe that doesn't necessarily help, but I, you know, I understand that that money, while it sounds like a lot, isn't necessarily as much as maybe it should be when you can, and I'm not out to bash anybody or the money or anything here, but you know, if we are the preeminent rodeo association in Canada, I mean, I think that's something that needs to be continued to be developed. I mean, it, that's great. And I'm like perfectly grateful for that. But um, yeah, as the CFR grows, I would be interested to see it. And especially even after my career is over, like I want to see guys in 10 years making a lot more money than I'm making right now. I think mm -hmm. that's what the sport deserves. And I think that's what it needs. And I think when rodeo starts paying a lot more, it's going to be, we're going to be able to put on better events. We're going to have higher caliber guys and more people are going to be interested in it, which I guess brings me around to like kind of what my job is now. And I think it's interesting to see, like I do a school every fall with uh, Colby Wanchuk in Vermilion, and they get almost an unlimited amount of kids to try to sign up for the bronc riding. And there's a lots of differences between bronc riding and bareback riding, obviously, but, and I'll get five or six, like, which is just the nature of the events. Like, more mm -hmm. guys want to be bareback riding or sorry, bronc riding than bareback riding. But I think at the end of the day, we are in a golden era of Canadian bronc riding and bronc riding period. Like I know we've had great Canadian bronc riders in the past, but like the things these guys are doing right now, you know, Zeke, Ben, Logan, Dawson, like all these guys, um, like, and everybody, there's 25 guys that could have made the CFR this year in the bronc riding. Okay. And and what I notice about that is I think I feel some weight of responsibility to make bareback riding cool again. Like, and I think, you know, rides on Virgil like that and, you know, Meng's video, like, well, those were never my intention before I did them. I'm excited for the opportunity for like 14, 15, 16 year old kids to see that and be like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Because I think that's how we revitalize, you know, bareback riding, especially, but rodeo, like we make it cool again. And, the Western lifestyle is really popular right now. And I think hopefully in five to 10 years, we see some kickback from that in the rodeo arena with greater contestant pools. But yeah, that's kind of one of the things I think about now. And I've talked to Orrin a little bit about this too. Like, I feel like guys like him and I have a responsibility to bring new blood into the, into the arena because we sure need it. And we can't just keep relying on the same rodeo families to keep supplying mm -hmm. us with contestants. We have to bring new people in. Yeah. One and I think that's on the way, like like you say, the stuff you guys are doing in the arena, like the, the big grads on the Virgils and the more exposure people get to rodeo via social media and, and YouTube and TV and all this kind of thing. Um I think there's gonna be I think you're gonna see more and more of them. And we have a pretty good, like a solid group of young guys like coming up and maybe not a big biggest pool of the bronc riding, but you see like um Ethan Mazarenko, um yeah. uh, Who's going on blanking on Blake Link's another one who's, who's who's up and coming. He's got some potential, and even Jace Lomheim, the, the the novice champion, like he's got some yeah. got some tools there to kind of kind of help with that next wave. So yeah, like you say, hope, hopefully it's on the horizon. And I wouldn't be surprised if it does get more and more popular as we move along here. Yeah, for sure. There's a bunch of us that are about the same age, you know, covering right around thirty, a little past thirty, and we're all probably going to retire within two, three, five years of each other, mm -hmm. and if that, if that happened today, like if we're all at an age where we could retire me, Orrin, Clint, Ty, Danton, like there's, there's a bunch of us, we could all retire today and nobody hold it us again, hold it against us. Be no. like, Oh, like you're way too young. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we did that, like if five or six of us walked, what would the CFR look like next year? Oh. And so that's where I kind of feel a little bit panicky sometimes. Like mm -hmm. we got to get some kids coming here or, yeah, you know, guys coming up from the States or whatever it happens to be, because I love bareback riding and I love Canadian bareback riding and I, I don't want to see that go away. So mm -hmm. I feel now probably more than ever that it's, you know, my responsibility and my friend's responsibility that are doing this to try to bring the schools or, and the outside attention is great, but I think ultimately that responsibility lies on our shoulders because we're the guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that's a good way to put it, man. And, and and we're lucky to have people like you spearheading it because I feel like that you guys are the people to do it. You're, you're part of that kind of, you're the veteran generation, but you're part of the generation that's that's engaged on social media and engaged with with giving back. And I think that's going to really help kind of move the needle um, when it comes to, to bringing new people to the sport. But 
I think that's all I got for you, man. I think we could sit here and shoot the shit for for hours and hours, but I don't want to take up yeah. too much of your time. And I'm I'm going to play some afternoon hockey, so we'll we'll have to pick this nice. up again another time. But man, uh, like we're all so proud of you. That was such a fun week to to be boots on the ground and watch you do what you did. It, it, there's no one more deserving in my eyes to to win a Canadian title these days, and and I'm I'm excited to see what you do in 2025. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. Sounds good, buddy. Okay, take care. This is. Uh, This has been episode 25 of the short round. We'll be back right after this. All righty. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Thanks once again to Cody Lamb for, for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, I was talking with about this with you before um, we hopped on clay. You, You weren't able to be part of the interview this time around, but, um, we talked mostly CFR stuff, which leaves the door. There's so much. Cody's such an interesting guy. There's there's probably two or three more shows we get out of him with everything else he's got going on. But uh, it was just a remarkable week to watch him, and and we like going back over that ride on Virgil and the way he rode that week. It was just it was cool to see. It's probably like my favorite story from the whole the whole week at the CFR. It it was up there for me too. Uh, having him on as a guest that that morning on our our podcast yeah. live there. It was it was a side of Cody that I I don't know if I've ever really come across and and that's that's not to say that that hasn't been him he's a no. he's been a long time contestant and everything but he had even, a, he had a energy around him that day you could yeah, feel it was him and I talked about that yeah yeah that it was just like this was his time yeah and and it was such a cool experience to see for somebody and and there was a lot of those moments right I mean mm-hmm. Macy Eclair who was going to stop her and everything but yeah. And and I know you mentioned you guys talked about that that final performance where horse doesn't perform and and you've got a, a re ride and and you're sweating it out and I mean I can remember they they rolled his horse into the uh, alley behind the the chute fairly early and so you're sitting there thinking is this horse going to get tired <laughs> yeah now? I mean True Grit wasn't a, isn't a young horse mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and everything like that so you just hope things are going to work and. And it was just kind of that that idea that there was there was nothing he was going to let get in his way, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. but but just yeah the sheer sheer look of of gratitude and and just feeling of, of accomplishment that you could see on his face there oh. when he won and and just everybody that was so so proud of him and, mm-hmm. and supportive when he when he did win it's it's always great to see in the sport yeah it's it, it's yeah it's, it's like yeah not just to sell anybody else short who won a title that week but just you could just see it on his every after he rode virgil after he made that big ride on true grit like you just see how much that those moments meant to him and how and and, and we all know all of us who've been around for a while we've seen cody's up and downs and everything he's been through and, and to see him make that move and, and deliver when when the chips were were kind of when he had to i guess and and he, he made it happen it was it was pretty fun to watch so thanks again to cody for taking the time to chat with us um i guess we should also mention clay there's a new uh edition of the Canadian Radio News out that kind of wraps up all of the CFR happenings and you wrote a couple of big time stories in there too so so maybe you want to touch on a few of that but it's it's a, it's a it's a great great uh, episode or great uh, edition of the magazine to kind of catch back up or maybe relive some of the cool moments from the CFR no doubt it's it's always great to get that opportunity to look back on that whirlwind of a weekend and and just to relive some of the storylines that happened and 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 just get the the side of the story from from things for me yeah there was a couple articles i had had that didn't quite make it into the the one just before cfr that rolled into this one uh on the stock of the year and the stock on tractor of the year and and then uh since i had wrote the the novice competitors for the cfr going into it uh two of the three champions had been season leaders as well so you had to try and look for those new spins. And and one of the neat facts that I, I kind of occurred to me after was, you know, like uh, Jace Lomheim and just lives down the road, goes to school in Huennan here. My brother had gone to Huennan for his last two years of school in grade 12, goes to his first CFR, wins every round, wins the title. Jace wasn't born yet. <laughs> this was 2006. <laughs> he was born the next spring. But 18 years later, same story, grade 12 student out of Huen and uh, goes in, wins every round and and just so cool, cool little factoid that uh, kind of hit me there. And I mean, just, yeah, getting to see all of these young guys coming up, 
all of the the winners in all of the events and and just we've got such a, a legendary team i mean you get diane finstead and and tim ellis and and dave and barb right and stuff mm -hmm. and and the fact they'll let me throw something in there too it's it's just pretty neat so been a yeah. good good experience on that end as well as pretty it's pretty epic to to you have that much talent in one magazine on the writing side of things. So if, if you haven't had a chance, head to the Pro Rodeo Canada website and, and check out all the awesome stories. There's one for every champion for like you did the stock contractor, you did the stock of the finals and novice champions. There's, if it's not in there, you don't need to read it anyway. So <laughs> it's, it, it Granted, perfect... I will say that there's a few stories we, we plan on. Uh, we didn't get to yet that mm -hmm. will get spaced out through there. I had one, uh, one, family member of someone reached out the other day and said hey where where's this one or or where's this one when i'd asked before and we will get to the major storylines that are in and around there it's mm -hmm. sometimes just doesn't quite work out at the time but i know barb barb has everything kind of in its place for for when we'll get to those yeah we're chipping away as, as some people may not know it's it's a small team but we we do our best to cover everything and 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 for the most part i feel like we all knock it out so we appreciate the patience from from all those on the outside but um i guess coming up we got the maple leaf circuit finals around the way clay we're kind of just waiting to see the finalists the competitors um episode 26 we'll have denny phipps back for a state of the nation with the what's happening in pro rodeo and we'll give you guys a full recap or a full preview i should say of what's coming up for the Maple Leaf circuit finals and then it's right into Vegas. So it's going to be a exciting end of 2024 here. Absolutely. I've been wanting to chat about the Maple Leaf circuit finals <laughs> for months. Uh, yeah, it's, it seems it's... Like it's such a big deal. And, and I still think back to when uh, you had Jimmy Lawrence on and, and talking about the, how, how much of a deal maker or a game changer Regina always was mm -hmm. back in those days. I mean, he, he basically kept rodeoing for three more years just because <laughs> yeah. he kept winning at Regina. <laughs> yeah. That's a funny fact. Like, well, sure. the years I'm off, I'm leading here, so might as well. But uh, having pro rodeo back at, at Regina as, as a part of something like this is, is just, I think it's a pivot. It's another. pivotal, man. Like, like you, you look at even this past year, like Jake Gardner wins the season leader in the bull riding and he won nearly $10,000 out of Regina last year. And Cavis Drake, same story there. He won a ton of money at Regina, which set up his season to ultimately win a Canadian title. So, I mean, it's becoming like a marquee rodeo on the schedule just with the amount of money available. If you can go there and do some work. No doubt. And the aggravation has just been such a, a great long standing event there in Regina that I, the sport of rodeo, I mean, professional rodeo right now is is such a, a great, uh, great thing to to have going on. And, and it's just a wonderful partnership for the CFR mm -hmm. or for the CPRA. I know there was attempts to have kind of that type of finals in different locations that just never quite fit the way they needed to. But mm -hmm. this is just a, an awesome partnership between two two really good organizations. Yeah, it's gonna be great, and like you said, I'm I'm itching to to get a preview down. But once we have all the information, we'll, we'll go get it set up for sure. But I think that's gonna do it, Clay. Episode twenty five, our milestone is it's it was short but sweet. But we'll uh we'll we'll be back very soon for episode twenty six.